This is Nick Black and today I'm talking to filmmaker Gordon Hessler. Firstly, Gordon, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us. Thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure to have somebody from Australia come all the way over here for the interviews. It's a pleasure to talk to you too. You were telling me beforehand that you were the only member of your family to go into the film industry. So where did it start? Where did the passion for films start with you? Well, it started actually when I was studying aeronautical engineering in England, in Reading. Even at that time, I felt I'd never get into the aeronautical business. I was not very good at mathematics and that kind of thing. And I always was just fascinated in, in pictures and tried to see if there was a possibility of getting into that picture business. But I got called up in the army conscripted. And then when I left the army, I immigrated to America because I felt it was easier to get a job there than it would be in England where the industry in England had sort of collapsed. And I just got into documentary filmmaking in New York and learned the craft there by the School of Hard Knocks, being a bit of a cameraman, a bit of a sound man, and a bit of everything. What sort of documentaries? Well, most of them were industrial pictures, which were high-budget industrial pictures, but some of them were very interesting documentaries. And one of them, which got a lot of awards, was a documentary about St. John's College, which is a very unusual school in Annapolis. And armed with all of these documentaries, some of which went to Hollywood, I burnt my bridges behind and tried to work here, which was very, very hard to get into, and finally got into Universal Studios as a sort of gopher. And they assigned me to Hitchcock, I guess, mostly because I had an English accent. And then I started off there as a story editor, and then worked my way up to producing and directing. How was it working for the master of suspense, Mr. Hitchcock? Well, he was an extraordinary character. Uh, there's no question about that. I actually worked for the TV, and that was run by Joan Harrison, and Hitch would approve all the stories before he would make them. It was very tough in stories, so it was very difficult to get a, a story approved that he didn't want to make. And we enjoyed a very autonomous life at Universal Studios. It was very enjoyable five years. And then when the series collapsed, I was the tail end of my contract, which was, was for seven years, it was taken by Universal Studios, and then I just produced and directed for them various television shows and, and that kind of thing. One of those TV shows, was that Hawaiian Fiber? Did Hawaiian Fiber, very numerous shows, many of them. That actually, you know, I can't remember all the, all the t television shows, but at that period of time I did many of them, jumping from one to the other. And that was a good learning ground? Yes, each one you learned you had to be well prepared because these shows were very little time to make all of them. And you were hired as a director to make sure that you finished your job on time. And how did you graduate to your first feature, Catacomb? What happened was I was working for Hitchcock and an agent said, look, I might be able to get you a directing assignment if you can find a good suspense story that they've rejected and that you liked. So I found a picture and they said, OK, it was for 20th Century Fox. I was asked to direct that. I got a leave of absence from Hitchcock to go over to England and shoot it there, which was a thing that had to be shot in three weeks. And that was the first film I made. And it was part of a series of B pictures that were being made by 20th Century Fox. This was the, sort of the, one of the last of the series. And the producer was Bob Lippert, who made The Fly. He made some one or two very good, but most of them were sort of B pictures, you know. Anyway, what happened was basically they sent me to England. I made the film. He never gave it to Fox, but he gave it to Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers liked it and obviously must have given me more money. So he asked me to make three more pictures as a result of this picture. I couldn't do those because Hitchcock wouldn't allow me from my contract. So I lost those three pictures. It was a huge mistake. I should have walked out. Do you remember what one of those pictures was? Well, they were made, but there were three B pictures that were made by Bob Lippert, but I didn't have anything to do with selecting the stories. But he said, look, I've got three more pictures for you to do. Do you want to do them? You know, I would be able to provide it, the projects, but since they, I wasn't able to do it, I didn't. They, they didn't turn out to be big hit films, did they? Do you know, I'd, no, they might have been, you know, because anyway, I had nothing to do with them. I want to go on to one of my personal favourites is a film called Scream and Scream Again. This is where you started your relationship with Vincent Price. Yeah, no, with the oblong box was the first which I made. And after that picture, I got a contract to do three more pictures for AIP. And Scream, Scream was the second one of that series. And that one was a pulp picture story, very, very gruesome story, but was real pulp fiction. But Chris Wicking, who did the screenplay, really brought it up 
on another level, a political level and a completely different level, and made it a much more interesting picture than it would have been, and I really enjoyed working that one. I recently saw it on Australian TV, and I think it holds up well. Well, I'm glad to hear that, actually. When we made it, we enjoyed it, and of course, AIP was very, very unsure because it's a very different picture from anything they've ever made. They were quite unsure how and what it was all about. But anyway, it, it worked out. The kids liked it. If you're an Amen Corner fan like I am, you'd like it because they appear in the film in the basement underground nightclub. That's right. I didn't know too much about them at the time. They would have been the number one band at the moment because they had number one singles. That's right. You mentioned the Oblong Box, which you shot before, which was with Vincent Price and Christopher Lee. How were they to work with? Well, they're all very interesting characters. Christopher Lee I've made subsequent pictures with and Christopher Lee didn't have a very big part but they just brought in all the three horror stars and put them all together so it wasn't particularly written for them but he became quite a big star Christopher Lee over here and made some quite big pictures. Very very interesting man, very interesting background. I think he was involved in espionage and all of that. He was an extraordinary character. I didn't know that. You also did Cry of the Banshee, which was another interesting film. Now, you sort of got into the horror genre. Now, was that something that you were interested in, or these just happened to be the projects that came by you? It just happened to be uh, the project that came by. It was a living for us, for, for our directors. You have to do what comes your way. But the Cry of the Banshee, what they would do is send scripts from Hollywood and then send it to us. And on the Cry of the Banshee, we had changed it enormously and everybody got frightened of the changes we were making. They were too, so drastic and it was not really, neither Chris nor I were too happy. What sort of changes were you making? Well, the script was such a B picture at the time that we got. It was very trashy to shoot that. So we tried to turn it into contest between the old religion and the new religion and shoot it up in Scotland and do something very different and then the studio got frightened and they said look you can't go this far you can only change it 10 percent and this sort of thing and they've already sold these pictures you know before you start it's already sold and they're no longer interested in it. but if you divert it too much then they all get very very nervous so it never turned out as well as we had hoped to do. Around that time you also made a remake of Murder in the Rue Morgue and Herbert Long did a fantastic job as the Phantom. Yes, Herbert Long and Jason Robert was in that and Jason halfway through realised he's playing the wrong part. He said, play any part you want and he chose the hero and of course usually the villain is the better part. But I said, well look, you pick the part, you can't play me. <laughs> you know? That was also altered quite a lot and we were disappointed in the alterations of the editing. It was a shame because it had a much better ending than what you saw. The producers think they're doing the film a favour. Well, what happens there, Gordon? If you're a big-time director like Steven Spielberg, you have total control over everything. But these under-contract directors, you don't have the final cut and that kind of thing. They, the studio has bought it. They can do whatever they like with it after you've turned it over and you've done your editing. You know, they may have their reasons, whatever they are, but a lot of the changes they made didn't make sense to me. And I think it would be better one day to put that to the way we originally had made it. Maybe you can now with the DVD. Yeah, but I don't know who even owns it. You worked with Miss Betty Davis. Now, how was Betty Davis to work with there, Gordon? Actually, she was absolutely fabulous because everybody was terrified of her. They had heard that she's very difficult to work with. She was exactly the opposite. She was just fabulous. I had one meeting with her, with the crew, because I asked for something I never did on the movies a week, to have a rehearsal. And we got into discussion on how the part was. And when she heard the way I would thought that she should play the part, she totally disagreed with it. She said, look, you're completely, it's not the way I was going to play this part. And I was thought, oh, that's the end with Betty Davis. Actually, she turned around and later said, yes, I agree with you, I think you're right, that's the way to do it. And she was absolutely marvellous all the way through, never had any problem with her whatsoever. She was just wonderful. Yeah. He also made a film called Medusa with George Hamilton. I think this was shot in Greece? That was in Greece, and I asked Chris Wicking again, who did the Oblong Box, to come and rewrite the script there, which he did. That was a film was really sort of made up as we were going along <laughs> and we had fun making it. Cameron Mitchell, he had the reputation of being totally crazy? No, he wasn't actually. He was delighted. When you get all these people on a Greek island, they're all very pleasant and it was a wonderful experience. And a future Miss Rod Stewart, Alana Stewart. Yes, she was there and the whole film was financed by Churchill's niece. She was Lady the Duke of Marlborough's daughter, and she financed the picture, I think, 
George Hamilton produced it and we stayed and shot a lot of it from her yacht there. She had a home there, a big home there and so on. It was a lot of fun, a very interesting time to make pictures there. One of your best known films is The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. Now tell us a bit about that, Gordon. How did Ray Harryhausen, how did you guys come together? Well, they were watching a, a film I made in Beirut and they apparently liked the footage. The film wasn't complete and they liked the footage and they asked me to direct their film. I had a wonderful association with him, Anglophile, I would say, Victorian and wonderful person and sort of a hermit because when I shot the film after he finished it, he spends a year in his own private studio completing the picture. And I had in the meantime directed another film by the time I came back, I was ready to edit the one that Ray had spent a year in the cellar doing this incredible work, which today is so much more easy, but at the time he did it, it was doing one frame at a time. It was an extraordinary a man, and he's a wonderful gentleman, and I see him occasionally from time to time when he comes to the States. Recently there was a Kiss movie, I forgot the name of it, Detroit Rocks or something like that, but you were the first man to make a Kiss movie, Kiss Meets the Phantom Park? Yeah, that's right. That was made uh, for Hanna-Barbera production. And it's a movie of the week, and they were extraordinary characters to work with. Did you know them, or did you no. know of their work? No, no, I never, never knew nothing about them. I didn't know their music, didn't understand their music. <laughs> I could see it really designed for girls who are just reaching the age of puberty. This is the sort of language of them. But they were wonderful, wonderful characters, all of them. And it was an unusual experience working with rock stars. How were they as actors? Because I know Gene Simmons has gone on to do other films, but uh, how were they generally as actors? Because that would have been the first time. Well, Jane's, uh, Gene was more involved in films and interested in films and always enjoyed horror films and always seemed to be a highly intelligent man, completely the opposite of what you see or you saw on the stage. He was a very interesting person to meet and I never got to know any of these people. You very rarely get to know any of the actors in the picture because you're so busy making the picture, you never socialize with them. Were they happy with the product? Were they involved with the production? Because they were the biggest band at that time. They were basically the biggest band in the world. I don't know because I never really met them after the film. I guess it did fairly well. But it was a movie of the week, but it was distributed as a movie abroad as a foreign picture. And I haven't seen it, and I don't know if it still stands up, but it was a, kind of a weird picture. After around that time, you made a film in Australia called Puzzle with James Franciscus, but also you had the leading Australian actors of the time. You had Sir Robert Haltman, Wendy Hughes, Gordon Piper, Gerard Kennedy, who was a very, very well-known actor in TV, and many, many other Australians. Now, how did this come about, Gordon? Well, I was just asked by an independent producer who I met at Universal Studio, a very young guy. I was just asked to make this film which was a movie of the week, and James Franciscus was assigned to it, wonderful guy, and much better actor than most people realize, a very dedicated. It was a wonderful experience working in Australia. Technicians were super. Just living in Australia for the three or four months that it was a revelation, actually. Did you get a chance to see much of Sydney, and did you get out a bit? Well, we saw most of Sydney and everything around it, and the story thing about Australia at the time, if you go 50 miles inland, that's the end of the population. That whole deep centre is completely unpopulated. And we went out to Cairn, I think it's Cairn, pronounced Cairn, yeah. and uh, spent a few days there after the picture was over. What are you up to at the moment, Gordon? Well, there's a film called The Return of the Thief of Baghdad, and it's a picture which is going to be shot in India. It's partially been shot already. I was not involved in that portion of it, but this is a new rewrite, a new script from what they had before, and hopefully it's going to go very, very soon. Right. Well, Gordon, good luck with that, and good luck with everything else, and thank you for taking time to talk with us. Okay, then, thank you.